Hi there. Um, yes, hello. Um, welcome to my talk titled All of the People, All of the Time to Kick Off Chaos Con. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Also, uh, even though I'm not technically there or is the day that I'm speaking the day that you're listening. That said, I'm going to be in the chat channels and we'd love to get your questions and feedback. And I'd also especially love to learn from your experiences on this topic. And again, I'm just really excited to kick off Chaos Con. I have deep admiration for the chaos in this chaos community and the work that we're doing, especially around people. So I hope that your time spent listening to me um, inspires even more work in some way. So hi, yeah, my name is Emma Irwin. I work on Microsoft's Open Source Programs Office. I live in beautiful British Columbia on Vancouver Island on the land, uh, the unceded territory of the Sioux First Nation. And before I uh, get into some of the topic area uh, of the, the substance of my talk, I wanted to give a bit of background that led to it that inspired me to think uh, in, in about this particular topic. So recently I went on vacation, which uh, normally wouldn't be such a big statement, but after months and months of kind of being in, in the area that I live with COVID, I think many of you can relate to the fact that that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> and so I took my family to the interior of British Columbia, just on the border uh, of Alberta in Canada, near um, and in the middle actually of the Rocky Mountains. So this area is really vast and wild and open and beautiful and uh, was different than than where we live by the coast so it was we wanted to learn as much as possible and, and experience uh, anything including history and one of the things became clearly obvious uh, after a while was the important role of the CN railway in this area and especially just by the number of trains that we saw we saw go by on our trip and as we were driving and uh, if you're not familiar with the CN Railway, that's the, the train line that actually was built from one side of Canada and the Atlantic to the Pacific coast in Vancouver. So uh, a really big accomplishment that allowed a lot of trade and travel. And that's putting it lightly. <laughs> um, and what was so interesting in this area and it was one of the kind of claims to, to um, uh, fame, if you will, uh, around uh, architecture of this type was that the railway had to go through these rugged passes of, of mountain where ice and snow collect. And in fact, tunnels were bored through mountains to make sure that the train could could pass. And so with this in mind, we decided to to learn more about trains. I mean, um, why not? It's not something that I knew a lot about except for um, having seen them along the roadway. And we decided to go and check out a train museum. And it was really cool. Honestly, there's this, you can see that this, this uh, museum had trains inside of it. It was meticulously looked after. The machinery was polished and beautiful. And it was really magnificent to stand up against some of these, like, these um, testaments to human achievement. And then to also experience the culture side of uh, passenger trains, with, uh, which you could walk through actually, and kind of imagine what it would be like sipping tea and looking out the window as the mountains went by. It was really, really impressive. and and really interesting and then but what caught my eye uh what caught my eye was something actually kind of at the back of the the museum it's sort of like this passageway that you, that you have to walk through to get to the the passenger ca cars to to continue the exploring of the machinery was these two framed photos and i just have one here i couldn't find the other photo but there's two framed photos that actually told the story of the builders so the people that built the train tracks the tools and the machinery that made it possible to go through mountains um and and um of course uh, if you know any if you've heard any of this story before you know that to put it lightly the story of the builders is also an uncomfortable one uh, that includes human human cost and 
you know, among others. So, and it also told the story of different different types of empowerment between people, uh, different access to tools and nutrition that made this actually uh, a, real a real story of sacrifice for all of the, the shiny uh, accomplishments that we'd seen so far. And I started to think, I always, when I learn something new, I try and, I often just find myself thinking about how I can apply a, an insight or something that I've learned to the work that I do every day, especially thinking about people and technology. And I thought, yeah, like we we do we do this in technology all the time and have the same kind of history is is somewhat parallel in that we love to talk about and share the stories of what things we've built can do, how beautiful they are know how we can enjoy them and how you know they've changed users life which are often great stories on their own um, but the builders are tend to be a footnote if not invisible a release note just tell the story of the builders and by builders by the way I don't mean it's not meant to be specifically engineers I mean all the different people and all the different skill sets that result in and the technology that we build. Um, but to tell the story of everyone has also at times been uncomfortable um, and sometimes hidden away. And that's it, I think, that open source is actually an area where those stories have been forefront for a very long time. <clears throat> um, we have been able to focus on the stories of the builders simply that working open has made it possible that being a, in a community and a contributor um, and through acts of bravery, I might add, and um, through acts of bravery and, and um, just pure will to change the system, people have told their stories. And we're, we've been very fortunate for that because the stories, these stories have helped us start to see change happen and start to create a shift. And I believe, I think chaos is one of the special places making a difference in that area because we're looking at it, the chaos project is looking at it so systemically, right? We can't, one time changes won't make as big a difference as thinking systemically about change. And so we owe a lot of gratitude to the people who've told those stories and made the stories of building software so visible and so central uh, in the, the longer term stories. And that said, I, I think that still that focus has been from the perspective of people in communities and people um, and contributors. And that the story of internal culture is still a little bit hidden away. And so what I propose is, or maybe not hidden away, uh, but more like it's not prioritized as much. We don't talk about it as much. I think it's the people internally working in open source is still a bit of a footnote when we talk about technology. So what I propose as a next step, and we'll share some of the things that, that we've been doing at Microsoft, is to focus our accountability on the experiences and the impact of people working on open source inside our organizations, that thinking more holistically about how our culture internally impacts our communities and products externally is really important, if not critical, to kind of creating that holistic view where we get to building more inclusive and safe spaces for everyone. So here's a photo uh, of um, some folks from Mozilla from my time at Mozilla where this group includes employees and includes contributors, uh, interns and others. There's a couple of faces I don't recognize there. Um, but as you might intuitively know, um, the the empowerment, the inclus inclusiveness, the behaviors of one group, one group being community or contributors or staff, uh, will directly have impact on the other. You can't have an empowered culture in open source without thinking about and designing inclusively for both. And um, another example or another photo I'll share with you is of KubeCon. This is a photo taken from 2019, and um, which I think just looking at it, I imagine that there's uh, lots of companies here, academics, students, government representatives, and I think 
well, maybe a, a few other groups as well. I'm sure that there's actually endless to try and categorize. But the point is, is that, you know, if we're just thinking inclusively in designing uh, empowerment for one group, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can ignore uh, the other. So we need to think holistically. The success of every individual, of every company and community is dependent on the other and vice versa. And if you like numbers, here's a number. 40% uh, of the 100 start projects, the top 100 start projects on GitHub, were released by a company. So I think that's really interesting. So that means that, you know, it, nearly half of the projects um, were released by people working for a company or organization. And then I start to ask myself, you know, I wonder what that was like. What were their experiences releasing open source? Did they feel ready? Did they know how to work with open source communities? What was the experience of the open source community engaging with those folks? How well um, was everyone set up for success? And I hope you're starting to see that um, why I think it's important to focus on that internal culture as part of the bigger, the bigger plan and opportunity. And when I think about uh, building blocks for um, healthy culture inside an organization, I think about these four these four areas. Uh, these are largely based on the culture code, which is a book I suggest reading. Also, if you're in the chat and you have other books that you think people should read or or talks or uh, presentations, TikToks, <laughs> whatever. I'd love to 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 hear uh, some of your suggestions as well. And this is also just based on my experiences over the years uh, building uh, culture inside and outside of organizations. So belonging is really uh, is really about as far as open source goes in the context of open source is really about making sure that people feel like they belong to something inside of an organization that matters to the organization and that that thing is open source. If people are working open source and they don't feel like that matters to the organization or that it's just something that people say they care about, then that's a lot different. It's also really important to make sure that people feel that they belong to the bigger opportunity of open source and solving some of the world's biggest problems. Belonging is really important. Uh, enablement and empowerment is maybe seems a little bit obvious, but I just want to emphasize that this is from both a psychological standpoint, meaning that people feel that uh, that companies have their backs, that they are empowered to experiment and to learn, and that they also, from a, a tooling perspective, have the tools, the processes, the support, uh, and um, policy to make them successful so that they believe it and that they can do it. The third is around purpose. So um, I know that especially working inside of organizations, we're thinking about our careers and helping people think about the, the bigger purpose of working in open source as it connects with their career goals, um, whether that's like building a specific skill set, um, growing into the, a role of leadership, um, or, or just having impact uh, in, a, in innovation in some way. Being able to personally connect that purpose to something bigger than, than ourselves is, is, I think, a big part of why I'm in open source and, and love to try and give that to others. And then, of course, uh, centrally is accountability and trust. Trust is something that we build within our organization when people feel empowered, that they belong and have purpose. And accountability is a thing that, that we all need to have for each other that, that makes that possible. So these are the building blocks that I think about whenever I'm building programs or talking to people. Uh, and, you know, often where you'll find some of the, you might find some uh, challenges for people. And you may ask yourself, who are the people to think about when you're designing this? And I, whenever I come to the slide, I always have that talking head song. We may ask yourself, I wish I could figure out a way to have a soundtrack because that would be the soundtrack talking heads to this. But anyways, <laughs> um, who are the people you, we think about? Well, you know, and part of this question might be coming from the fact that you're like, well, you work at a company with thousands of engineers and and, and that's true. Um, or, you know, you might be saying I work at a, um, a startup or within an academic institution. I've also worked in those types of organizations. And I'll just say there's still similar types of roles and challenges that people face no matter the size of the organization 
no matter the maturity level of a project or team, there's going to be similar kind of trends that you can think about. And I'll share with you uh, some of those that um, I think about and the types of things that we're doing at Microsoft that, um, that maybe you can learn from. So the first is to think about those in community facing roles. So by community facing role, I mean, um, I mean people in roles that in any way interact with somebody that's not a teammate or working in their company. That could be someone who writes a blog post on behalf of your company. That can be somebody who's releasing code, re releasing open educational resources, um, commenting on an issue, testing a pull request. I mean, there's just so many ways. If, if the act of their job puts them in front of people who do not work for you, then that is a community facing role. Although, although of course there's like much bigger scale for some folks who are community managers or are open source maintainers. And the risk of, of bringing people into these roles without ensuring that they understand what their empowerment looks like and without the trust that you have their back is that they, you know, people might endure. And I know that this has happened in companies and organizations that people feel that being a community manager means that you have to put up with negative behaviors as part of their role, which is not true. Um, if the company, <laughs> which is not true, nor should it be, um, that enforcing the code of conduct is something that they have to figure out, which should never be true. Right, an organization should have uh, support set up to support support to make sure that no one is handling difficult behaviors alone. You may also have people that don't don't understand their accountability for inclusion and you know things like um, using inclusive language and and thinking about diverse perspectives uh, or how to build inclusive spaces. So all of these things can be uh, you know just deficits in what people know. Their intentions might be really good. Uh, Kim Creighton, whose um, series, uh, educational series on racism is really, really good. If you get a chance, I highly recommend her. She has a, a great uh, quote which says, intention without strategy is chaos. And I think that's really true for those in community-facing roles. We might have really good intentions, but without support from the organization, without designed uh, structure and supportive resources, uh, it can really literally be chaos. And so uh, one of the ways that we try and support or that we're being strategic <laughs> in avoiding that chaos is to provide training to everyone in community facing roles. Uh, and these, this is like, think of it like a first aid course for um, creating healthy and inclusive communities. It's not the paramedic level. It's not like everything you need to know, but the basics of what people need to know to be successful and to trust the organization has their back. So that's basically covers things like HR resources, um, encouragement to take breaks when you need them, um, understanding of how to escalate if they're experiencing behaviors that make them feel uncomfortable, unwelcome, or challenged, and uh, and also other kind of um, policy and uh, gotchas that make sure that data classification uh, is, is invoked to protect people's privacy. Um, so that's something that, that we embed and it's really, really, not only is it helpful to people, but it also gets people asking the right kinds of questions about building inclusive communities and, and hope chatting with each other. The other category of people that we think about is probably not surprisingly those using and releasing open source software. Um, and this is, again, thinking about that, the block of empowerment making sure that they have the tools that they, first of all, they understand, um, uh, uh, basic understanding of compliance and tooling and security, but also that we have tools set up to support their success. So the empowerment is very squarely in the tooling space here. And I'll share with you a couple of ways that we empower engineers and others releasing and using open source. The first, I mean, I couldn't do a, I can't show you all the steps of a wizard, but this is the main page for our GitHub wizard, which walks people through the process of creating a new open source project on GitHub. It's not just a matter of creating the repository, but the, the steps also uh, trigger business review, including license and, and other policies. So the, this has been set up to 
reduce friction for engineering practices just to make sure that they can follow a series of steps. They don't need to worry about who needs to be involved because they'll be automatically brought in. And by the time that they click the button to release publicly, that they'll know that uh, all that they have been fully compliant. And this takes the worry I mean, away for a lot of people uh, that they, you know, they don't have to to ask a bunch of questions or worry they've done something wrong because they've had a uh, kind of sign off from the, the folks that are involved. We also have something called uh, the component com called component governance, which reviews Microsoft usage, detects what open source people are using and lets people know what information about that project they need to know, including vulnerabilities. So I'm going to give you a quick demo of component governance. At Microsoft, it's crucial for our developers to be able to manage their open source compliance. The main tool that we use to achieve that is called Component Governance. Component Governance is an internally developed Azure DevOps extension where teams can register and review their open source usage. As most Microsoft employees work in an Azure DevOps ecosystem, it's crucial that our compliance systems are easy to use and meet developers where they work. Component Governance uses a build task which is automatically injected into most Azure pipelines at Microsoft and detects what open source a team is using. This build task then sends that information up to the Component Governance service for what we call registration. The results from that build task process appear in a repo's components view, which allows teams to review the components that they're using, as well as information such as when they started using it. Component Governance supports many popular package managers such as NPM, NuGet, PIP, and Go. To keep teams secure, the system also calls out to publicly available vulnerability data sets, such as GitHub advisories, to look for known vulnerabilities associated with a component. Those vulnerabilities appear as alerts in the main component governance alert view. This gives teams a centralized view of any potential risk to their repo. Alerts contain information such as the name, a description, the severity, discovery date, and in many cases, recommendations for resolution. Component Governance also maintains a set of custom licensing rules that have been developed in partnership with our legal team to alert on any components that may be legally risky. These appear in the UI as legal alerts. The most common type of legal alert is that a component needs to be reviewed further by Microsoft legal team. Component Governance knows how to take the team's repo information and kick off that review process, which also takes place in an Azure DevOps environment. Finally, with the legal information that Component Governance already has, it can generate a notice file for teams to include in their release. That's Component Governance. It's how Microsoft Teams manage their security and legal open source risk in a way that is closely tied to their daily work environment. And there you go. So component governance is a great example of reducing engineering friction and also helping educate people as part of that on uh, what it looks like vulnerabilities in third in um, open source projects and how we might contribute as well to um, helping solve those. And my tool that we use Azure DevOps extension. Sorry, I'm going to have to. Teams can help employees. There we go. <laughs> um, so another group that we think about is maybe uh, also not surprisingly, but um, in, in we're, our goal is to try and increase the people who identify as being a contributor to open source or on behalf, behalf of your organization. So it's not unusual to release or use open source, um, but in encouraging people to think about contribution as part of their role in open source is really important. Um, but of course, there's lots of legal questions there as well. You know, what can I do? What can I say? Uh, and, and as well as a lot of confidence issues. So sometimes people, and this is really common in open source generally, feel that, you know, if they're not perfect enough or that they might not represent your company well enough. And so myths busting some of the, the ideas of what it means to work openly is really important. Some of the ways that we handle that are to, to have, you know, um, really honest discussions about what it means to be a, um, to make meaningful contributions in open source. And especially using the term chopping wood and carrying water. I think uh, most people are familiar with that, kind of like helping with the non-glamorous work of open source. And um, the CNCF actually has an award around it. So. We encourage people, at least initially, to think about how they can 
uh, help projects with some of those non-glamorous tasks that actually are most important in maintaining a project. We also have something called a contribution business review, which is when people encounter a CLA or have bigger questions about contributing something like a feature, an extension, that we can trigger a business review process again, just to make sure that that everything is fine on their end and they don't need to worry at all. So not worrying is definitely a theme in, in uh, a lot of our business review work. Contributing to open source is also a, uh, a, a criteria for voting in our FOSS fund, which is I'll get to uh, in the next slide, but Microsoft gives away $10,000 every month as, as one of the many ways that we try and give back to open source. And in order for people to vote on a project for this funding, they have to have contributed to open source. So we're trying to encourage people to do that. And we created this resource. This is uh, available on Microsoft slash FOSS dash fund uh, to help people think about how to just get started. So there's information here about the good first bug that opening an issue is a contribution documentation and writing, diversity inclusion. And sometimes this points out to some people that they've been contributing to open source all along if they're on a board or that sort of thing. So we have this really easy resource to help people uh, unblock themselves if they're not sure. And and yeah, so I mentioned the Microsoft FOSS Fund. As of this moment, we've, we've uh, sponsored 20 projects in the last year or so, and this is a way that we uh, we help our employees help give back as the nominations come from our employees and are based on projects that they use and care about. We more recently have added uh, diversity inclusion as a reason that people can, uh, a project that is working on diversity inclusion as another uh, criteria for people nominating. And finally, Actually, not finally, but the second last uh, category of person that I think about is people who are new to Microsoft or new to open source. They may not be new to Microsoft, but they might be new to open source or they're new to both of those things. And uh, specifically, we think about onboarding, you know, meeting people at the door at the beginning and helping them understand a lot of things that we just talked about. And so we're starting to onboard or embed onboarding in existing programs. So open source onboarding is not separate, but we're trying to work with teams that are already already doing this and, and meeting people as they come in the door. So they have the very basic understanding of who the community is, what the tools are, and most importantly, how to ask later when they've had a chance to kind of orient themselves. So the first thing that we do is, uh, as I mentioned, is we introduce people to the concept that there is a community inside of Microsoft that exists and they are warmly welcomed. Uh, there's uh, This is also on the main page of open.microsoft.com. If you want to watch the faces flash by, it's, it's, there's some cool animation there, all linked to people's GitHub repositories. So just letting people know that they are part of the community and then that there's touch points for uh, ongoing touch points. So it's not just faces on a website, but there's meetups where we get together. There's a newsletter that shares the accomplishments, the releases, the inspiring stories. Shoutouts are a big part of our newsletter. We want to like highlight the good work that people are doing, contributing and uh, in the in the ecosystem. We also have, of course, chat channels, which uh, most people do. But where to find us? And something called the Open Source Champs program, which uh, is. Um, basically a membership of people who self-select to help others, which is really great um, expert leaders who are ready to help people avoid pitfalls or and connect with some of the, the tools and resources and, and policy that will make them successful. So community touch points. Um, and then training is a big part of, of, of things. So, but not just training, um, collaborative learning. So. Um, we have a series of workshops that we run called Open Source Maintainer Workshop Series. This is for people onboarding to Microsoft, but as an ongoing weekly offering, we do about a 20 minute presentation on each of these subjects. And then we have uh, breakout rooms with activities uh, because we heard that people really wanted to meet each other more, which makes sense with COVID and being stuck at home. Uh, so we try and get people meeting and talking about some of the problems they're working on as part of these workshops. And um, we also have uh, all of this, we pull all of this together in a GitHub project board where we 
because we know as people are coming into things, there's the fire hose and we don't want people to have to check back to some list or some chat. So we have this GitHub for open source at Microsoft project board where there's first steps, which are kind of really important and, and really mostly around the, the community touch points. Um, second steps, there's specific training that we encourage people to take, including like the code of conduct one that I mentioned is really important and so on. The idea is that people can move there their uh, tasks over to the done column, which you can't quite see here because the screen isn't wide enough, and can also have conversations with their managers about the types of things they've done. All training is recorded in our learning system, so as well, uh, people can show their accomplishments. And speaking of managers and, and manager discussions, there's also uh, a, definitely a group of people, if not everyone, uh, who wants to make sure that the things that they're doing in open source as part of their role connect to the things their managers expect of them. Uh, and that they have the words to, you know, pitch how open source works. It's not just just um, being able to describe why, but to pitch that, you know, we should do this more and this is why it matters. But it's a very common question to get. I don't know how, you know, how to draw the line between this and the things that my team might be doing or my project might be doing. And so the the answer to this, the, one of the ways we've answered this is to create again a bit more training. This is a self-study course called Mapping Your Open Source Career. Uh, I've worked with HR, uh, HR career development experts to uh, create a resource that uh, people can first of all meet others. Uh, inspiring people across the organization through storytelling, and we have done produce some videos for that, and also just to walk through the steps to to document the things that they want to accomplish in their career, and how they think open source can help them. And then there's you know a form they not a form but a, a worksheet that they fill out and work on with their manager. So the idea is by the end of this course and the end of the activities associated with this course, they're able to have those conversations with their manager, and there's real clarity between teams and um, each other about what that means. So this is one of my more favorite <laughs> resources that we created. So to kind of wrap it all up uh, as best I can, <laughs> I think that uh, creating a sense of belonging in your org organization around open source is really critical part of building culture. Um, empowering those people by reducing friction in the engineering process and providing opportunities to learn and grow learn and grow, learn and grow is really uh, central to that. And connecting people with each other and a purpose around open source will create that accountability and trust that really has the chance to accelerate the ecosystem to get where, where we need to be, to make our projects and communities truly a reflection of uh, our end goal, to basically getting to the story of the builders to make sure that this is lovely as the story of as what they build. Well, that's my talk. Thanks so much.